Here we'll talk about three-dimensional planning and anatomic shoulder arthroplasty, which we believe is a tool for both a new and experienced shoulder arthroplasty surgeon. Glenoid loosening is the most common reason for failure of total shoulder arthroplasty, and surgeon-controlled factors greatly influence glenoid loosening, and these include malposition, incomplete correction of pathology, and persistent humeral head subluxation. Reasons for malposition can be broken down into three broad categories. The first includes evaluation of the glenoid pathology. The second includes the preoperative planning, and this includes the choice of the implant, for example, not recognizing the need for more than a standard implant. The choice of the position of the implant, for example, removal of too much subchondral bone, residual retroversion, or excessive joint line medialization. And the third broad category includes the execution of the preoperative plan. And studies have clearly shown that three-dimensional planning improves each surgeon-controlled factor. Two-dimensional CTs are limited by the fact that the planes of acquisition may not be in line with the planes of the scapula and frequently are not. It may lead to inaccurate understanding of the pathology and you are unable to virtually place an implant. Three-dimensional planning is more accurate and more reliable. Uh, particularly in the face of glenoid bone loss and posterior erosion that's commonly seen in osteoarthritis. And most notably, it allows virtual implant placement. Multiple studies have shown the wide deviation from the preoperative plan when using 2D CTs, and this is even more severe and worse pathology. Uh, this is even true in the most experienced hands. And three-dimensional planning has shown a significant reduction in deviation with or without a patient-specific instrument. Three-dimensional planning can be broken down into three broad categories, including the evaluation, which begins with 3D reformatting, establishing the anatomic planes and evaluating pathology, and evaluating the pre-morbid glenoid. Next is the preoperative planning itself, which includes placing the virtual implant, evaluating the need for an augment or graft, and evaluating the position and trajectory of the virtual guide pin. And finally, the execution of the plan, which begins with removal of the remaining cartilage, evaluating the glenoid microanatomy from the preoperative plan, and then placing the guide pin according to the plan. In anatomic arthroplasty, we aim to recreate the patient's premorbid anatomy. And typically, this includes some degree of retroversion, as normal retroversion is probably around 7 degrees. And we know that B type glenoids have more premorbid retroversion than other glenoids. Uh, we also recreate the patient's inclination and joint line position, which often will require some augmentation to recreate the lateral position of the joint line, rather than reaming down the high side leading to medialization. And we find that adequate correction of both the glenoid and humeral side will correct residual subluxation of the humeral head. You should take with you to the operating room a minimum of five digital or printed pictures from the plan, if not more. We'll discuss later how each of these is used intraoperatively. These include the axial and 3D on-foss view of the central guide pin, as well as the axial and on-foss view of the implant itself. And if you're using an augmented component or a bone graft, the first stage of the reaming. Step one includes 3D reformatting. These first few steps are often automated in most commercially available softwares. However, it's still important to understand the method uh, behind image acquisition and uh, definition of anatomic planes. Here you can see that the axial plane does not appear to be uh, a true axial plane, and if you look at the faint green and red lines representing the coronal and sagittal planes, they're 45 degrees off of the scapular body rather than perpendicular and parallel to it. Once we've converted the images to 3D, the first step is to define the plane of the scapular body. This is made by three points, the first of which is the trigonum scapula, which is the confluence of the scapular spine and the scapular body. The second is the inferior angle, and the third is the center of the glenoid. We next need to define the plane of the glenoid itself. These three points must be placed on the true glenoid rather than the osteophytes, as this will obscure the true interpretation of anatomy. Here the green line represents the true version of the glenoid, and if we were to reference an anterior osteophyte, it increases the sense of retroversion. While if we referenced a posterior osteophyte, it decreases the sense of retroversion. Comparing these two lines, it shows the wide variation that's possible when interpreting the version of a specific patient. This is where you need to understand how your software may be automating the version calculation. 
Step two involves quantitatively and qualitatively assessing pathology. Here we can see that the version is negative 25.4 degrees and the inclination is 3.2 degrees. When we examine this from a qualitative standpoint on both the two-dimensional and three-dimensional images, it's clear that the morphology is consistent with the B2 glenoid with an intact anterior glenoid and a posterior glenoid that has acquired bone loss. It's important to recognize both during planning as well as intraoperatively that there is a large anterior osteophyte that does not represent true glenoid anatomy. We next need to evaluate the patient's pre-morbid glenoid anatomy, which may be a new step for many. This is represented by the anterior half of the glenoid in a patient with a B2 morphology. We do this by using the angle tool within the software and drawing a line consistent with Friedman's line from the medial border of the scapula to the center of the glenoid and then across the anterior half of the glenoid. And in this particular patient, the anterior glenoid is retroverted 10.3 degrees. So our goal will be to place an implant that is retroverted roughly 10 degrees. Now we place the virtual implant and begin the planning phase. Once we load the implant, we must then choose the appropriate size, version, inclination, and roll to recreate our preoperative goals. These include restoration of the patient's premorbid version, inclination, and joint line position. If we were to try to recreate an arbitrary version of zero degrees, you would see here the significant amount of bone that would be removed during the reaming, as well as the significant medialization of the joint line. The literature shows that removal of the subchondral bone increases the risk of glenoid loosening, and we believe that medializing the joint line leads to detensioning of the rotator cuff, which may increase the anterior-posterior translational motions of the humeral head on the glenoid component and may increase the risk of loosening. Now, even if we increase the implant's retroversion to 10 degrees to match the patient's anatomy, we can see that there is still a significant amount of subchondral bone that would be removed, as well as significant medialization of the joint line. Step 5 is to evaluate the need for an augment, a bone graft, or a reverse arthroplasty. Now that we have seen that a standard implant would lead to too much medialization and too much removal of subchondral bone, we now bring the implant out to the ideal position and evaluate the amount of the implant that is unsupported. Leaving the implant with only 50% backside support is unacceptable, and we believe that bone grafting in the setting of an anatomic arthroplasty can lead to unpredictable results when the bone graft fails to heal. We then virtually trial an augmented implant and choose the appropriate size to obtain full backside support. We then examine the axial, coronal, and three-dimensional images to ensure that the implant is fully seated and to ensure that we are still recreating the goals that we set out to recreate. The next step is to evaluate the position and trajectory of the central guide pin once the implant is in its final position. We first evaluate the axial and three-dimensional on FOSS view of the pin to evaluate the position and trajectory of the pin relative to the biconcavity of the glenoid. In this case, the pin sits directly on the biconcave line. However, this is not always the case as the pin may sit just posterior to the biconcave line. We also look for other identifiable bony landmarks to help us place the guide pin intraoperatively. And in this case, the patient has a very discrete apex along the inner margin of the anterior osteophyte, and the pin is directly across from this apex. Many instrumentation sets come with guides or templates that are the same size and shape as the eventual implant, and these can be used to also facilitate placement of the guide pin when referenced to this picture of the on fos view of the implant itself. For this particular implant, the axial view provides a tremendous amount of information. The implant is augmented 7 millimeters posteriorly, which is letter B, and it requires 2.9 millimeters of reaming on the anterior edge, which is letter A. So this combined distance is 9.9 millimeters, or roughly 10 millimeters. So if we were to use a 9 millimeter guide, which comes with the instrumentation, we would rest it on the anterior edge, and we would leave it off of the posterior edge 1 millimeter to be able to place the guide pin in the appropriate position and trajectory. This level of three-dimensional planning allows standard instrumentation to be used in a patient-specific manner. The next step is to remove the cartilage. Upon initial exposure of a B2 glenoid, the glenoid fossa appears as a single surface, but upon further inspection, you can see the intact cartilage outlined in white here, 
Upon further preparation of the glenoid by removing the cartilage with a curette, you can see the large anterior osteophyte outlined in the white dashed line, the paleoglenoid or premorbid glenoid in the white solid line, and the pathologic surface of the glenoid posterior to these. For demonstration purposes, we will use this model as the surrogate patient for the remainder of this video. The next step is to evaluate the glenoid microanatomy from the three-dimensional plan. Several of these features we have already identified. We first note the position of the central guide pin relative to the location of the biconcave line. And again, we note here that the pin sits directly on the biconcave line. We then look for other identifiable landmarks on the glenoid surface or its rim to help us place the central guide pin in the appropriate position. In this case, the patient has a large indentation along the inner margin of the anterior osteophyte that is directly across from the location of the central guide pin. We next reference the on foss view of the implant to note the amount of osteophyte that's overhanging in multiple directions, in this case, most notably anteriorly. You should take either digital or printed copies of these images to the operating room to help you with the final step, which is actually placing the central guide pin according to the three-dimensional plan. As noted earlier, one option is to use the 9mm posterior guide, placing it in this position on the glenoid surface, resting the anterior edge on the bone, and leaving the posterior edge off of the bone one millimeter while advancing the central guide pin. During the planning process, we use the patient's premorbid glenoid as a guide for the ideal implant placement. So an alternative method of using standard instrumentation in a patient-specific way is to use the patient's premorbid glenoid intraoperatively to help place the central guide pin in the appropriate position and trajectory. Initially, it's obvious that the prominence of the anterior osteophyte precludes the use of the premorbid glenoid as a resting surface for the drill guide. The anterior osteophyte is then carefully resected collinear with the premorbid glenoid using a rongeur to create a flat resting surface for the drill guide. The guide is again placed on the glenoid surface according to this planned location and with firm axial pressure the guide is held against the premorbid glenoid while the guide pin is advanced. Sometimes manual pressure on the guide itself can aid in seating the guide against the premorbid glenoid. At this point, the surgeon should pause to compare the position of the pin to the position of the planned pin in the three-dimensional plan, as well as the position of a trial implant compared to the position of the planned implant in the three-dimensional plan. Once you are satisfied with the position of the pin, the remainder of the procedure typically proceeds according to the manufacturer's recommendations. However, when using an augmented component, one additional step is required uh, in referencing the three-dimensional plan, and that's the depth of the anterior reaming. So in this case, we ream the anterior glenoid until we have bisected the pin with the reaming, and then we compare this to the three-dimensional three plan to ensure that the first stage of reaming appears just as it did in the planned ream. This completes the three-dimensional planning and its related steps and the rest of the procedure proceeds as usual.